What's up everybody, my name is Sarah. I hope you are all having a spectacular day. And as we're approaching the last week of December here, I hope you are all enjoying your holiday season. Even if you don't celebrate the holidays, usually this is a pretty global downtime. Work areas start to kind of shut down and disengage a little bit. So it lets people spend more time with family and re uh, rest, recuperate, and get ready to start a new year out with the old and in with the new. So I hope you are all making the best of this period of time. And I know this can be a stressful time of year for a lot of people, especially if you have kids. Hopefully you're taking it all in stride, getting the rest and recovery you need and are looking forward to a new year. So going into the new year, a lot of us are looking at making, whether they're New Year's resolutions or goals or plans, uh, a lot of that will surround work, social lives, family, and of course I would be remiss not to talk about training. So I wanna talk a little bit about what I have been doing with training, what my kind of plans are for the coming weeks. Um, and then I wanna talk about uh, some tips and tricks that might help people who are like me and several other people kind of relegated to the inside of the house, which don't really have a lot of uh, opportunity to go outside and ride and have a hard time with the monotony or the difficulty of doing those longer rides inside. So I will finish up with that, but let me just start with going over what I have been doing for training and what my plans are uh, and kind of the way things have kind of changed. So if you haven't watched my last couple of videos, I made a couple of Zwift videos, but I did mention that I have broken my shoulder. I broke the uh, greater tuberosity, uh, basically a piece of bone is fractured clear through right on the outside of this uh, the top of the shoulder, the head of the humerus here and uh, I am very limited in my ability to use this arm. Now, you can see I am moving my hand around. This is a huge improvement. This is probably about 30% functional, uh, maybe a little bit more, which is great. It's coming along and healing quite nicely, but because of where the break is and how that area of the bone hinges into the uh, socket and uh, through all of this kind of different, the moving parts within your shoulder, we don't want any kind of uh, friction or interference to move that bone while it's healing, that piece so it doesn't become displaced. So right now my range of motion is uh, limited as well as my ability to bear weight. Uh, a lot of the soft tissue and uh, areas, uh, the tendons and all these kind of muscles are uh, very weakened. A lot of them are just turning back in uh, now. It does cause some discomfort and pain, but it's a process but I have my x-ray scheduled for, I think the first Tuesday of the year. So that would be, I believe the seventh. And hopefully that will be at the six week mark. And I hope that that will have an x-ray that shows complete bone healing, after which I have been assured that I can actually go into extremely aggressive physical therapy. So my only limitation would be pain and discomfort, but as it stands right now, there doesn't appear to be any concern for long-term tissue damage, any kind of tears. Uh, just more acute uh, trauma than anything else. So I wanna talk about a little bit of what my training plan has been and what I'm looking at for pretty much the next uh, 10 weeks-ish. I am two weeks into, I'm using a trainer road plan right now and it is the Sweet Spot Base Program. Uh, there are two uh, parts of this program, part one and part two, each of them being six weeks long and they kind of build on each other. But the uh, methodology behind this program is sweet spot. It's to be pushing your functional threshold power up from the bottom and uh, basically by working just under threshold and uh, basically having your body adapt to that level of effort, you are pushing your FTP up. It's a little bit different than polarized training, but it does fit into my injury and what's going on because some of these more difficult efforts that require a little bit more leverage and a more lean and aero position on the bike are still very difficult for me. So there's a few different schools of thought surrounding, uh, you know, sweet spot training. Um, there is science to back it up. It's what I've decided to follow uh, this particular time of year. Like I said, I'm two weeks in. Uh, just to give you an idea of what like a standard week would look like is Mondays are scheduled off. You can rotate that somewhere else if you need some flexibility, but as built, the Mondays are scheduled off. And then there are six workouts during the week. Five of those are sweet spot intervals. They can range anywhere from an hour long to uh, I believe two hours long is about the longest. It's built into the plan as it happens. And uh, the intervals themselves go anywhere from like the low end of six minutes all the way up to about 30 minutes. 
and then you can kind of adjust. There are different variants of the workout, so if you need to adjust the duration, if you want to add a little bit more on, if you need to break those intervals up with maybe a 30 second or 60 second rest, you can work that type of stuff in. You can also add in recovery and warm up time if you need that type of thing. But uh, and then there's one day a week that's usually falls on a Friday, which is a recovery level workout, usually about an hour of zone two. So that's basically just letting your body adapt to the stress, keeping things moving and so on and so forth. So at any rate, I've already talked about what I'm doing for training. And uh, I, if, if you can see here, I don't know if you can read this, probably not, but I did mention hour and a half to two hour training rides with regularity and some of these coming on weekdays, even after work. Uh, this is the high volume plan. Last week I did about 12 hours of training and 705 TSS. Uh, this week I'm probably gonna be about 11 to 12 hours, which is a lot of training volume for a lot of people. And doing two hours of the indoor trainer, a lot of people may perk their ears up at that and say, no way, no how, I'm not going to ever be able to do an hour and a half, two hours more on a trainer. You can't pay me enough to do that. And quite frankly, I used to be in that same camp a couple of years ago. I couldn't even imagine sitting on the bike for two more than two hours. So I wanna talk about a few different elements that might help you uh, if you have a training plan or you really wanna be able to tick off more miles and hours on the trainer uh, because indoor training is a lot more effective in a lot of ways than outdoor training and you may not have the accessibility to go outdoors. So how you can tick off those miles a little bit easier inside and I'm gonna break them down into three categories. So those categories are going to be one, comfort, two, fueling and nutrition, and three, entertainment. So I'm gonna start with comfort because that's gonna be a big one. That's gonna be a physical limiter to how long you can be on the bike. And there's a few different things that you should look at. And number one is fit. Uh, your bike fit. If you've never had a bike fit before, if you just bought your bike and somebody kind of measured your inseam and your reach and did a couple of magical adjustments to the bike and sent you on your merry way, you're probably not in the most comfortable or effective position that you can be on your bike. Now a good bike fit can cost you anywhere from on the very low end about $150 to maybe upwards of four or $500 for like a pro level fit. Usually somewhere in the middle of that range, maybe around two to $300, you can get a good solid a computer-based bike fit. And what that does is, is basically take your dimensions, take your measurements, and then kind of track your movement while you're riding and try to straighten you out and maximize on your position so that you can have the best power transfer. But more importantly, the greatest amount of comfort because there's no point in having a high level of power if you can't sustain it because you're uncomfortable, you're constantly shifting in and out of the aero position or having to kind of stand up and stretch out more frequently than would be required by somebody who has more comfort on the bike. So starting off with a good bike fit, getting in with your local bike shop would be a really good start to make sure that you're comfortable in all those positions, on the hoods, on, in the drops, and sitting up on the tops. As a, an extension of that, saddles. Saddles are something that are extremely subjective, but they're very important to being able to remain, again, comfortable on the bike. You don't want a, a saddle that's so uncomfortable that you're shifting forward off of your sit bones onto your pelvis. It takes away from your power. It changes your hip angle. It can have a huge amount of detriment to your ride, and it's really not particularly comfortable. It can cause a lot of discomfort in the saddle area, whether it's saddle sores or soreness by way of chafing, or just in your sit bones, in your general posterior region, sitting for hours on the bike, if you're starting to feel really uncomfortable at hour one, hour two, you may have the wrong saddle on your bike. And if you're looking to the guys in your, your local cycling club or race groups to tell you that, you know, the high-end, you know, Pro Stella Italia saddle that costs you $400 is the right one to get, they're doing you a disservice because everybody has different anatomical needs for a saddle. There are different shapes of saddles, there are flat saddles, there are the waved saddles, there are uh, saddles with voids or holes in the center of them, short nose, long nose, narrow saddles, wide saddles. There is no right one. You have to find the one that's right for you. If you can get uh, kind of an agreement with your local bike shop, they might be able to let you take a, um, 
like kind of a, a trial saddle home or a, kind of the promo saddles that they get, let you try that out for a couple of days, try a different sh couple shapes and sizes, it will save you a couple dollars, and then you might be able to get a good in indication. But you'll probably know it pretty quickly. If you sit in a saddle that's comfortable, you will know almost right away that you just feel like you're you're in the right place, you're sitting in a very comfortable position and you can go all day in that position. It doesn't matter how much you spend on it. You might spend $50 and have the perfect saddle for you. You might have to spend $400. Don't worry so much about how much the thing weighs and what your gains are in terms of dropping weight off of your saddle. Realistically, if you're losing power output because you're uncomfortable, any watts that you saved on a lighter saddle are going to be null and void. So if you're worried about, you know, the weight weenie element, don't. Just worry about being comfortable and that's going to translate to indoors even more substantially because most people are in a very fixed position on the bike. So that, that bike is not swaying underneath you and you are not really unweighting your sit bones in those kind of microseconds while the bike sways. So you're getting a lot more pressure than you would on the road. So it makes the saddle a lot more uh, important. As an aside, one of the things that I'm looking at probably for the end of next year for the off season is, is potentially a rocker plate. Um, those are great at uh, simulating a little bit more of the bike movement. Years ago, I had a, um, a Kurt Kinetic rock and roll trainer. It was just a wheel on trainer, but even that little bit of movement in, of the bike and even be able to get out of the saddle and move that bike by, side to side, it just made it feel a little bit more natural um, and, and a little bit more comfortable long term. While that's not the most natural position, it does help. And some of these rocker plates, specifically the one I'm looking at is the Saris, uh, I think it's called an MP1 Infinity. It is uh, a, a rocker plate that has a fore and aft adjustment as well as a side to side leaf spring. So it actually moves very similarly to the way a bike would in real life. And then the more bike throw you put into it, the more it will move for you. The leaf springs will uh, withstand that kind of pressure. And then if you're just kind of riding wrong no normally, you'll just get that slight amount of sway in the bike, just enough so that you just don't feel like you're sitting on, you know, a, a steel fence post. So it uh, might make it a little bit more comfortable. If you have the budget, might be something you want to look into, especially if you do a lot of training indoors. Uh, the last thing is cooling. Uh, there's a lot of bad information out there in terms of cooling. A lot of it's just kind of bro science or HTFU kind of con uh, conversations. And evaporative cooling by way of uh, a fan or airflow is key to indoor training sessions or any kind of training realistically. Uh, a lot of people will tell you, oh, you know, the more that you sweat, the more that you're accomplishing and the harder the work you're doing and, uh, you know, you're, again, HTFU and you're making more gains. It's not true. It's not a true at all. And unless you are sp specifically working at heat acclimation for a specific event or race that's usually done the six weeks prior, there is no reason to abuse yourself in a high temperature environment. You're not gaining anything by doing that other than heat acclimation, but arguably you're losing your high end performance and your ability to make gains. What happens when you have a lot of heat uh, in your area, your perceived exertion goes up and your ability to reach higher potentials by way of power output goes down. So if you can maintain a comfortable, cool environment by way of using fans, um, if you're in an air conditioned environment, great. You know, in the winter time where you might have the heat on and you don't have the luxury of having maybe a trainer out in a garage or basement or somewhere cool, perhaps crack a window and let some of that cooler air start flowing because you're gonna build up a lot of heat in that room just by uh, your own body heat and then the equipment that you're using. So make sure that you're staying cool and as comfortable as possible. You're still gonna sweat, you're still gonna get work done, but your perceived exertion will go down enough that you'll be able to continue to push that uh, high end of uh, potential or performance upwards, especially over time. Next, let's talk about fueling and nutrition when it comes to your rides. There is a lot of contentious argument and a lot of different scientific resources out there that will tell you all sorts of different things about nutrition. And again, nutrition, much like your bike fit and your saddles, is very personalized, but there are some basic tenets that everybody should really look to follow to get the best uh, longevity and to make your longer rides more sustainable. And 
It's fueling your workouts. It's important that you remain fueled during your workouts if you want your output and your performance to be at a, uh, the optimum level. Usually there's this rule of thumb that anything an hour or less, you don't really need to fuel during the workout, perhaps hydrate. If you're working a little bit harder, it might be a good thing to the very beginning of the workout, take in something like a gel for a quick shot of energy. But if you're going into your quick one hour workout, even if it's high intensity, if you go in topped up on your glycogen stores and fueled, you can usually get through that first hour without fueling. After the hour, you should really consider uh, fueling with carbohydrate sources. Now, I'm not gonna get into fasted training and fat adaptation. There are particular rise and there's a particular way to do that. But in a general sense for training, you do wanna be able to fuel your workouts for your best performance. And if you're having a hard time getting through these longer workouts, starving yourself for fuel is not going to help that any. So a good rule of thumb is that uh, between 30 and 60 grams of carbs per hour is usually what an athlete is going to require. We're only able to really process, the number really seems to float between 90 to 120 grams of carbs. That's about as much as you can process and anything more than that you're really not going to absorb. But for typical workouts, anywhere between 30 and 60 uh, grams of carbs are gonna be what you need to keep your fuel uh, topped up for your workouts. Now you get, uh, for each gram of carbs, there's about four calories involved. So usually that's gonna fall somewhere in the range of 240 calories if you subscribe to the uh, 60 grams of carbs per hour. And even if you try to top yourself up at around 90, now you're looking at about 360 uh, calories per hour. So you can kind of plan your fueling around that. A lot of the uh, sports nutrition has a uh, macronutrient ratio that hits what you need. So whether it's your gels, your chews, your um, you know things like um, the Cliff Blocks, even things like Gatorade, your your liquid-based nutrition. However, you think you can take in those calories are usually broken down to get you the right carbohydrate uh, ratio for the number of calories ingested. So you find what you can digest best. Um, a lot of people fare best on liquids. I know personally, I, I have an easier time with liquids. I am trying to practice uh, integrating more things like gels and chews um, so that I can practice for uh, outdoor type of riding. I don't fuel well on the bike. It's something I personally know I need to work on. So do the same thing. Uh, you can eat whole foods on the indoor trainer. You can eat bananas, you can eat toast and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, whatever you, would like to enjoy or enjoy the eating to keep yourself fueled up and feeling strong on the bike is great. If you are approaching an event or something that's going to require fueling, just make sure that you practice using those items you're going to use in a race or a ride at least a few weeks prior indoors to make sure you can digest it. Some of these multidextrin or even um, liquid-based nutrition can be a little bit tough on the stomach if you're not used to digesting it. So just practice for the outside uh, road, even a couple times per week just to get yourself acclimated. But in terms of comfort for long-term riding, if you're topped up in your sugar stores and your car carbohydrate stores are up at the top, you'll feel a lot more comfortable. There is kind of this idea that people want to change their body composition as they train, and that's perfectly normal and commendable but it's really not a good idea to diet on the bike. So don't cut your calories on your ride, fuel your rides appropriately. And then if you're gonna run a calorie deficit, make sure that you're pulling that from elsewhere. So again, if you're trying to make two hour rides, three hour rides more achievable, don't starve yourself on the bright bike because it's just gonna make you feel more miserable. And the last thing is entertainment. Um, you know, uh, we aren't a bunch of robots. Most of us can't sit with our nose in our stem and stare at our computer and just mentally tick our way through intervals. Especially this time of year, it's tough with all the distractions out there to remain disciplined or adherent to our workout plans. So we need to find ways to make sure that we're getting on the bike and doing the workouts as prescribed. And now more than ever in history, it's been easier to do that. The low hanging fruit is really a lot of these programs, Trainer Road being one of them, but things like Zwift, uh, Ruby, Sufferfest, uh, Full Gas, it was a road grand tours. I'm sure I'm missing a ton of these workout programs, but their weights, uh, they create visual interfaces for you to engage and be more present in your workout 
than has been possible when you're just staring at a clock. Cause let's, it's like a watch pot never boils and an interval never ends when you're staring at the clock. So sometimes it's easier to see things, whether it's a graphical representation or in terms of Zwift, you know, watching your avatar move through space. Uh, I think for a lot of people, Zwift is probably one of those programs that checks all the boxes. It gives you different achievements, challenges, races, group rides, badges. It gives you just continual uh, feedback, feed forward in terms of uh, achievements to unlock or a sense of completion so that you know that you're working towards something. And then on top of it, you know, you're, you're moving through space and your effort on your bike matches the effort of your little guy on the screen. So it's more like being outside. Is it 100% like being outdoors? No, but it makes it a little bit more um, akin to being outside in terms of where you're putting your eyes, where you're putting your focus, and the ability to not just stare at the clock as it ticks those minutes away. So that's something I would recommend for free rides. When it comes to structured training, Zwift does offer some structured training, but if you're gonna use something like Trainer Road or uh, Ruby or any of the other apps, one of the things that I use to help pass time is just outside entertainment. So usually zone one or zone two, I can take in pretty much entertain any entertainment that I like without really losing anything from the workout or being overstimulated. So if I wanted to watch a movie, if I wanted to watch some YouTube videos, if I wanted to listen to some music or some audiobooks or what have you, I can pretty much take in any kind of entertainment that I, I want. Um, it's usually tougher to watch Zwift on those slow workouts because your guy doesn't really move very fast and then you get distracted by people moving faster than you, but your prescribed workout is that zone one, zone two. So you get a little antsy. So usually you want something different to keep your eyes on to help pass time. Once I get into zone three, more like sweet spot and low threshold efforts, like a lot of these in the plan, I find that I really, I either lose too much presence or I get too overstimulated by things like a movie or a video. So I take one of the elements out, which is usually the video element or the visual element, and I focus on just the audio element. So I will listen to a podcast, I will listen to an audio book. And generally what that does is it lets me stay present in the workout and focused on the objectives. But when I know I'm in the midst of an interval, uh, I can kind of disengage from the clock and I can just listen to something that entertains me and uh, is, you know, in inspires me in some way or it intellectually stimulates me so that I'm not focused on the time, but I'm actually focused on listening to what's being said and learning and absorbing new material. Uh, I find that that helps me quite a bit. Once I get past that kind of low threshold area into higher threshold or VO2 max, I can't take any outside stimulus. It's too much. It's too distracting. It gets aggravating. You know, that's the point where little squeaks and scrapes and noises really make you want to punch somebody in the face. So then on my higher uh, intensity intervals, I usually am looking at things like music. So just get music that is uh, upbeat and something that kind of drives me. And usually something like that will bring perceived exertion down. So a lot of these things that I'm talking about are about the perceived exertion. So if you're, you're having a difficult time physically or mentally on the bike and your perceived exertion is high, your ability to achieve the workout parameters, whether it's by time or by power, is going to be very difficult, if not impossible. So at those higher levels of intensity, I look at music, something that brings the perceived exertion down, brings the motivation up. There are some people who might say that you'll become too reliant on something like music to perform. I don't think that there's really any science to back that up. Uh, there is science to back up the fact that music does bring performance up and perceived exertion down. But if you're in an actual event, like if you've ever trained with music and then gone to race or gone to a, like a, a fondo or group ride, you have all the impetus you need there. It's just a different level of stimulus. Maybe it's music while you're at home by yourself, but you have a completely different motivating factor when you're in a race or in some kind of ride and you don't need that music. So I, I would dismiss any idea that you'd become too reliant on it because there's just no evidence to back that up. But those are the things that I use to keep myself entertained so I can do these longer rides. I have a much easier time with it now than I have in years past. Um, I've come to find that I'm starting to look forward to and enjoy my rides. Even when I'm tired, I lock in, get a good podcast on. Maybe I'll throw on Zwift in the background 
and uh, I'll, I'll tick off those miles and then I'll be happy when I'm done. So I know I've done a lot of talking in this video. I tried to be as thorough as possible with the things that have worked for me in terms of getting through my indoor cycling season. If you guys have any of your own personal strategies, tips, tricks, podcasts, or videos that you like to listen to, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. Please go ahead and hit a thumbs up if you like this video. It really does help out the channel. Any other questions, comments, concerns, again, comments down below. Subscribe if you haven't already. I wish all of you the happiest of holidays and a happy new year, and I will catch you in the next one.